This is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Find us on the web at jsparty.fm. There you'll find our popular and recommended episodes, clips, aka JS Party, the good parts, and more. Big thanks to our partners at fly.io. Over 3 million apps have launched on Fly, including ours. You can too in five minutes or less. Learn how at fly.io. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. What's up, party people? I want to say about a new sponsor of ours, Jam.dev. Yes, Jam.dev is one-click bug reports that devs love. It's just too easy. Get Jam for free today at Jam.dev. And today I'm here with Danny Grant, the CEO and co-founder of Jam. So Danny, how do you describe Jam? If you've ever reported a bug, you've probably had this happen to you. You see the bug, you write all the information into a ticket, engineer opens the ticket, writes, works fine on my end, closes the ticket. That's because those of us, like me, who create tickets, never put the information that engineers actually need. Because we don't know, and the words that we use in English to describe an issue are never specific enough for an engineer. Like if I write that login didn't work, didn't work could mean so many different things. So Jam eliminates all of this miscommunication. It's a tool that lets someone like me, a product manager or a QA person or someone in support, one click to grab what's on the screen, plus everything in DevTools, console logs, network requests, the timing waterfall, session metadata, everything, and package it into one link in the ticket so an engineer never has to ask a follow-up question. So I've reported many bugs before as a PM, as an owner, as a whatever, and that sounds like it saves a ton of time. This saves afternoons of debugging. You no longer have to jump on a call and share screen to debug. You no longer have to show a PM how to find the console and look for logs. Engineers say it saves them at least an hour per issue, and it's mostly just that back and forth they no longer have to do. But what I hear from product managers who use Jam is they used to, after reporting a ticket, get a bunch of follow-up questions from engineers, and now they create a ticket and they never hear about it again. Okay, friends, go to jam.dev and learn more about what Jam is doing for teams to make bug reporting and all that fun stuff super easy, super fast. Get Jam for free today, jam.dev. Again, jam.dev. Hello, JS Party people! Those lovely, familiar BMC beats mean that this is another episode of JS Party, your party about JavaScript and the web. I'm K-Ball, I'm your host this week. I'm joined by my friend Jared, Jared Sento. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I am excited for this, actually. So, Jared, in case y'all don't know, is behind like every JS Party episode. You know, he's one of the original changelog folks. He, uh, even when he's not hosting, he's got his ear on what's going on. And so today I'm excited to actually turn the camera around, take mm. a deep dive into Jared. Um, sometime last year, we did a dive into another one of our panelists' toolbox. We went into Nick Nisi's toolbox and we covered a bunch of fun stuff. You know, Nick is a tool geek. Yes. I think we could have spent that whole episode looking at his vim.files or other things like that. But today, we're going to dive into Jared's toolbox, and I'm kind of a little excited to see how different it is, given that Jared is not just a developer, but he's also a business owner, a longtime podcaster, all of these other things. So, right. Jared, let's go. I'm excited, man. I am your guinea pig, your lab rat. I am a dead frog covered in formaldehyde, ready <laughs> to be dissected by UK ball. Let's go dive deep. Okay. Well, so let's start with coding. Okay. Because that's, you know, what that's everybody where starts, here has that's where in common. All. That's where it all starts. So, 100%. you know, what are, what tools do you use? Okay, so long journey. I mean, text editor is the primary tool that I think of when it comes to coding. Old school Vimmer. I've told the story before, but I was forced by my college teacher to my programming 101 teacher and 102 to use Vim. He said, you're going to SSH into a Unix box and you're going to code in Vim. He said something like Pico or Nano are great editors if you are 
writing a email to your grandma, but if you're going to write code, you're going to use Vim. And so I learned Vim not because I saw some fancy video on YouTube, but because I just didn't have any other choices. Well, I had to learn Vim if I wanted to pass my class. I mean, same, to be honest. I learned Vim in a, it was a Fortran class, I think, okay. taken as part of like my either E or physics or something like that. Yeah. So I don't know if I would have made it over that hump because it does have that steep initial learning curve had I had a choice, but I didn't have a choice. I made it over the hump and my college teacher was very proficient in Vim and he would live code in, in class and we would watch him and be like, oh, wow, you can really move fast if you get good at this thing. So that was also motivating. So I learned Vim, used it for many years, still use it off and on all the time, mostly in the terminal, mostly SSH into a machine. That's my go-to in terminal editor. However, I do like a nice graphical user interface specifically for text editing. And so I picked up TextMate back in the day, eventually moved over to Sublime Text and Sublime Text 2. Uh, never hopped on the VS Code train, although I have installed and I have used it. I use Sublime Text for a very long time. And nowadays I have recently, within the last six months, switched to Zed as I find it the only other sublime text alike that is fast enough and light enough that it feels sublime-esque. Sublime was always just faster than all the other ones. And VS Code started fast and then has like slowly like gained, in my opinion, some weight. And so I've been using Zed and really I still keep sublime text launched. And just for like one-offs, you still can't beat it and like I'm just gonna open up a buffer and like do some stuff and do some text manipulation and then just get rid of it, it's still faster. But for like project work, I'm chilling in Zed. So let's dive into Zed a little bit. What does okay. it look like for somebody who hasn't used it? Zed is very much an editor in the ilk of VS Code or Sublime Text. I mean, it's going to look like that uh, project, you know, the uh, file directory on the left, you know, buffers on the right. Here I am stuck in the middle with you. I don't know how you describe it. It's a text editor, you know, it's... Uh, it's built by the major developer that worked on Atom, A-T-O-M, inside of GitHub, Nathan Sobo. And it's built from the ground up to be really fast. And so that's why I appreciate it. It also has fancy things built right in. But very much, I think, feature, feature for feature, it's going to feel the most like VS Code. But in my opinion, a little bit faster, a little bit better. And so I've been... I've been using that uh, open source now, so that's rad. Nice. What's the plugin story for Zed? Well, now we're gonna get into Jared's toolbox, and I am not really a plugin guy. So, like, there are plugins. Uh, I have a few. I install some stuff. It's fledgling, I would say. It's nowhere near what VS Code has. So, if you are a plugin person, nowhere near what Vim has or NeoVim, just because it's a pretty new editor and a pretty new community, and they've been building like the extensibility story after they built a few of their other stories up. And so it's like bare bones in there and a lot of first party stuff. So they're trying to batteries include that sucker. So a lot of it, I just don't care about like it's built in, but if you are heavy into plugins and extensibility, like snippet support just landed recently, which was holding me off for a long time. Cause I do have some snippets that I use commonly and I just couldn't even use them in Zed. Uh, that's there now. So like it's getting there, but yeah, plugins are probably the current thing that is, that's limping along in that ecosystem just because it's a pretty new editor. And I see on their blog, their latest blog post is introducing Zed AI. Are you yeah. using the uh, LLM based coding tools inside of Zed? Yes. So they have, uh, they first built Copilot right in when Copilot kind of got big and then they realized there's more to life than Copilot. And so they, made it to where you can switch in different models, uh, different tools. And then they've just recently launched like a first party ZAI. So you're plugging into their deal. It's a, I think it's going to be a paid arm. It is a business. So they're trying to find ways of making money. I think teams is one of those ways. And I think that AI is another one of those ways that they'll make money off of this editor. I just plug it into Llama 3.2. And so I do use Llama inside of Zed, but you can use whatever model you like, ChatGPT, Mistral, blah, 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 blah. All right. Well, so staying on the software train for a little bit, any other tools outside of editors that you find yourself going to? 
Uh, the terminal. I mean, I'm a big terminal guy, so we could live in the terminal for a while if you want to. Are you? Do you use Tmux? Do you have a? Are you one of those who like? Oh, I need my custom terminal setup. Like, what does it look like? Not so much anymore. I was definitely a tweaker and a configurator as a as a youth when I had the free time and the desire to like really make my system look cool. I used to have one of those terminals that would uh, come down from the top. Did you ever have this one where it was like it was a hot key away? They're probably still out there. And it was like a heads up display for your terminal. <laughs> so you would just like hit a hotkey and it would slide down over the top of your other stuff and you'd be like coding and then you'd hit it again and it just slide back up again. And when I worked in an office, that was cool because like people would see that and they'd be like, wow, this guy's hardcore. I don't care about such things anymore. So I use like built in terminal.app. I don't have an iTerm. I'm not using WesTerm or Kitty or any of the fancy stuff that Nick Nisi thinks is rad. They are rad, I'm sure. But Terminal that app is just good enough for me. I'm a longtime Tmux user, and I use Tmux mostly via a configurator tool called Smug, S-M-U-G, which if you are, have been around long enough, you're a Tmux guy, right? I am. Yeah, so do you use a configurator? I know they're like a Tmux desk sessions thing. No, I I have like a, I have an old Tmux config that I have that my my finger is like embedded in my brain and fingers that I have right. then passed down from machine to machine over the probably decades at this point. Yeah, most of my configs are kind of set in stone because I'm just like set in my ways, you know. So I don't really need to like I'll add a new a new function into my bash RC or my whatever it's called, CSHRC at this point, like once a year. I'll add a new function and be like, oh, that's a nice quality of life improvement. But I've got so much built up over the years that I don't think about it as much anymore. However, Smug is a Tmux configurator. So there's also Tmux Sessions, which is a plugin for Tmux that does a similar thing. And there's an old Ruby gem called Tmuxinator, which is where I got started. And it's basically like define your Tmux sessions in a YAML file or in, in a, a list of YAMLs. And you can start up Tmux with all your settings into a project. Bam. And then you can suspend it, restart it, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And so Smug is now a a basically a rewrite of Tmuxinator in Go, which means you know universal. It's actually fast. Yeah. Well, not just that, but just it's not going to like you don't have to do the whole gem file thing. You know, like there's no gem install. You're not like which version of Ruby is this? Oh, I got to get a do, different version of Ruby. Universal binaries for the win. I think it's just like brew install Smug. And I use Smug to control Tmux, and then you're inside Tmux, obviously. But my Tmux is pretty basic, you know, just like a couple open, not tabs, what are they called? Panels. Yeah, a couple open panels, you know, switch between them, just basics, basics. But I do use it all day, every day. There is something interesting there in terms of like, I feel like being a developer, you have to be learning all the time. But like, I have a bandwidth for how much I can learn in any particular time and stuff like my tools, right. it only changes very slowly because it's it's good enough. I agree. And I think it's the kind of thing like, I think the toolbox analogy is really fit because when you're first getting started, you got like this empty box and you're like, okay, I need a bunch of tools. And so you go out and you find them and you test certain ones and you find the one that you like. And then you have to learn how to use that tool and you configure it and you tweak it and you customize it. And so it's like, now I have this tool. You're not just going to throw that out. Like you're going to hold on to that sucker and then you're going to go find another tool and eventually your toolbox kind of full. And at this point in my career and probably yours as well, it's like I might change a tool here or there or tweak one like every quarter or once a year or, you know, I get excited when I have a new tool. I'm like, hey, I grabbed one, you know, because I just I got a full toolbox. I don't really need to be acquiring anymore. Absolutely. I will say the the sort of rise of the AI assisted coding stuff and like how now with something like Claude uh, or Sonnet and things like that, like right. it really is good enough that if you don't start figuring out how to put that in your toolbox, you are getting left behind. So that's been a forcing function for me. But. Me too. And I'm probably slightly behind the curve, even from you on that. I am using them, but I'm not, I'm sure I'm not fully leveraging because I haven't tested all of the different ones and made sure I'm using the best one. I haven't tried Cody. I haven't tried Claude. I have tried Cursor. I mean, we don't want to maybe get into AI later, but I've tried a bunch of these things, but I'm also kind of like a vanilla LLM user at this point. Kind of also letting some of it shake out. Totally. And these funded companies build the tools better to where it's like, okay, this one's amazing. Go get it, you know? 
All right. So we've talked about terminals. We live in the terminal a little bit. Anything else that are go tos? Do you you know have maybe let's get into dev frameworks and and coding languages. Like, do you sure. have a go to for quick scripts versus product versus what have you? Yeah. So changelog.com is all Elixir. So it's using the Phoenix framework. I've been writing that. I've been maintaining that code base and advancing it since 2016, which is probably the longest single code base of my career as a contractor. I've you know, worked on projects and then moved on, or I think I've maintained something for a few years. Uh, I did have long-term customers. So maybe like three or four or five years would be like the longest I worked on a code, a single code base. Um, but I've been on this one since 2016. So like that's coming up on eight years, I guess. And it's all Elixir in the back end and uh, HTML oriented. I'm very much an HTML oriented web developer with JavaScript sprinkles. And um, that's the way I like it, and that's the way I've written it, and that works just fine for me. There's no spa framework in the front end of uh, changelog.com, and that's languages. Now, that's for, I guess, product. That would be a product, right? For one-offs and scripts, I still usually just start with Bash and then go immediately to Ruby as soon as I'm outside of Bash. I, I just can't get more expressive. You can do a lot in Elixir and I have a, I have like two Elixir scripts I wrote and I'm like, there's just more ceremony here. And Ruby, like for text manipulation and looping and command line stuff and like shelling out and getting a result. And then I know I've spent time with said and awk and I can do all those things, but like Ruby for me is just way faster to get that stuff done. Totally. I still like, even if I have to do like some math, that's not immediately obvious to my head. I just like Go to the terminal, hit IRB, and there I go. <laughs> yeah, right? Seriously. So fast. It's the closest you get to like your thoughts becoming code. Like your pseudo code is basically like add a dot here and some curly braces, and now it's actual code, you know? And for me, that's just probably never going to be replaced. Also, because I got, you know, so many years right in that language before I went to Elixir that it's just so easy to get stuff done. So, yeah, I got a ton of Ruby scripts just, you know, all over my hard drive. Um, in the terminal, I guess uh, one other thing I didn't mention, a very cool tool that I added in my toolbox last year is A2N. Have you heard of A2N? I have heard of it. I have not added it to my toolbox yet. So talk through it. Yeah, this is a very cool one. It's basically like, I like a tool that just upgrades your life and doesn't require anything else. Like there's no learning curve. There's no adoption really. This is a shell history upgrade basically built by a gal named Ellie Huxtable, and we've had her on the show a couple of times. She's she's whip smart and great, great user experience person. And basically like, you know, the up arrow or the control R searching your shell history, uh, if you've done that, which we all have a hundred times, like this just basically improves that in every, in every possible way. And so uh, you install it, it runs in the background and it takes over certain keystrokes in your terminal in order to have fuzzy search on your shell history a lot like fzf would be if you can figure that yourself but it's very pretty as well and then it also offers advanced things i don't care about like syncing your history across machines and all this kind of cool stuff i'm a one machine person so i don't really have that problem but if you had a desktop and a laptop and you wanted shared shell history across everything like she has a service that encrypts that and synchronizes it around and it's an awesome cool it also provides stats which is fun like you can look at your most used commands and stuff like that. And so for someone who absolutely depends on control R yes. or command R just working, like is it drop in replacement? You won't. Yeah. Okay. There's one little thing that it changes, which is really just like an orientation thing that took me a minute, which is when you control R command R, whichever one it is, which for those who haven't done this before, this provides like backwards search of your recent command. So I can hit control R and type L and it'll be like LS, L, something else, you know, and you can like pick that one and just hit enter and it'll execute. And so this is very handy. When you do that in classic terminal, it'll just like do it right there where you are. And when you do that with A2N, it will bring up kind of a reverse chronological uh, list, not reverse chronological, reverse last in first out list, like your most recent used going upward that match the current search. And because of that, it moves your search down to the bottom of the screen. And so it literally just moves it from where it was to the bottom. And that just took me maybe a couple of days to like, it bugged me for a day or two. 
because I'm used to it just being, I'm staring at it and now it moves it down to the bottom. Other than that, which is a tiny thing, it's a drop in replacement and it's better in every conceivable way. So I just install it and run it and haven't looked back. So try that one out. And maybe if you do have any uh, issues that it changes, because those of us with long standing habits, it doesn't take much <laughs> to be like, eh, you know, this ruined my life in one minor nitpicky way. And that's sometimes enough friction to be like, not worth it for, for us. Um, so I'd be interested to hear your results, but man, I, I installed it and have not looked back. All right. Well, I just installed it. I'll let you know. Cool. It doesn't appear to have broken my command R. <laughs> nope. Or control R. So. so that's a big one that I, that I installed probably within the last year. Other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty vanilla terminal tools. Besides Tmux, Smug, A2N. Let's talk maybe about some of the other non-software things then, because you have this other side of that you're a small business owner, you're a podcaster for longer than almost anyone. Yeah. What are your go-tos? Let's start with, with podcasting maybe. What are your go-tos there? Sure. So in software world, as you know, Cable, we use Riverside to record, and that's a web app that we pay for. It's a software as a service web app that puts... I think almost every newfangled web technology into play in order to have a really nice experience for us. And that handles a lot of the problems that we used to have to work around. It used to be a lot harder to podcast. We had Skype and we had multiple enders and we had you know this, that, and the other thing, call recorders, blah, blah, blah. Riverside has really simplified the tools that we need. And um, we've been using that for a couple of years now pretty, pretty successfully. There are all... Uh, competitors to that, which are also good. So lots of cool tools in the podcasting space. And then we take we take the recorded stuff and we do all our editing in Adobe Audition. Now there's a lot of tooling around that now that didn't exist before as well, around editing specifically, whether it's Descript and the ability to read the transcript, delete words out of the transcript, and it edits the audio, which is just a really cool idea. But for us, we've been doing it this way for so long that we just prefer kind of the power and control that we have in Audition that you give up when you use some of these online tools for editing. So everything goes into Audition. All of our files are synced via Dropbox. So we don't think about Dropbox very often, but it's just a core piece of our business, 100%. Long-time users of that. And then everything else in terms of publishing is all just self-built. So I built a open source web app, like the one I mentioned, that does everything from like we have a MP3 file to completely published, syndicated, promoted, blah, 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 is all just coded up. So custom tool, a custom tool. Got to love those custom tools. Oh, yeah. Well, the nice thing about them is that they're custom. <laughs> so it's both a gift and a curse, right? So like we can do whatever our hearts imagine. And we've done some really cool stuff, like our transcripts get synchronized over to GitHub and they're open source on GitHub. And so you can actually help improve them there. And then if you improve them there, they get synchronized back and, you know, they get sucked back into our database, stuff like that. We do a lot with chapters and with MP3 metadata that you couldn't do elsewhere. So we've been able to really customize it to be exactly the way you want. And then the curse is, if we want something new, we got to build it. Like everything, <laughs> you have to build it all, you know? Yep. If it's broken, I got to fix it. If we want it, we got to build it. And so it's that on-standing, you know, gift and curse of custom software. It's really paid dividends, though. We were on WordPress back in the day. And look at us now. I mean, we could have been a WP Engine customer. We would be so mad right now. Oh, man. Well, and you clearly have not fallen into the common developer challenge of rewriting the platform more often than you publish. No, we couldn't do that because we published five or six times a week. I'm not that fast of a coder. But we definitely thought about doing some rewrites. And of course, when you when you build something eight years ago, you know it has its warts. The technologies uh, that you pick are no longer best in breed. I actually think I picked a pretty good tech for this, but... I'm actually very pleasantly surprised that I don't have any sort of itch. I think there was once when like, should we go Jamstack with this? Because it's so static content, like a lot of it's static content. And so pre-built HTML makes a lot of sense. And we're not doing that. We're doing caching. We do some stuff like our MP3s get pushed to R2. 
and then CDN from there. So there are in our feeds as well, which are just massive XML files at this point because we want to put all of our episodes in there. So we have like 12 megabyte XML files that we're serving up, which does get slow, even with a fast programming language, if you're, if you're dynamically producing that each time. So we push those off to R2 and then we, we serve them from the, from the CDN from there. So we've done a few things that are Jamstack ish, but I definitely have thought once or twice, maybe we should just switch to an entire Jamstack approach and it's never been worth the lift because there's so much surface area to the app at this point. Like you think it's a simple app and it is. And then you go look at all the different stuff it does. And you're like, it's just a lot of stuff here that I had to rewrite. It's simple in the surface area it exposes to people. Mm -hmm. But that, there's a lot of complexity under the covers. Totally. At the risk of diverging too far, are there f features or functionality that you want to add to the app that you're looking for in the future? Well, we definitely want to provide, like, I think there's definitely some stuff we could do with our transcripts and our episodes that are language model focused that would provide value. Uh, similar to just like a really upgraded search functionality where you can say questions like, have they ever talked about Jamstack on JS Party and just get an answer, you know, versus like, I'm going to go search. We did have somebody who built a thing like that, but it was more like, talk to an LLM version of Jared and K-Ball and, and with our personalities. But the end product, like you play with it for five minutes and then it's done. You're like, okay, that was, that is what it is. But I think having a librarian, so to speak, because we have thousands of episodes now and we get questions like, have you guys ever done this show? And I have to go find it through the search functionality or not. And then be like, I thought we did, but I can't find it. I think we could definitely build something there. That's a big one that would be cool, but just a nice to have. And then one thing that we really want to do, we have taken steps towards with our custom feeds, but haven't gone totally, is like bring our membership program completely on to the site and off of the Supercast, uh, which is another tool we use for our memberships. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah, yeah. complete custom, put up filters, maybe LLM-based filters. Is this about this or that? Right. Then you get real expensive, so they got to be paying. Right, yeah, exactly. I did build custom feeds this year, which was something that our subscribers have asked for for a very long time. One small wrinkle in our membership is, for instance, if you're just a JS Party listener and you want to support JS Party, you sign up for Changelog++, it feels good, you support us, but because of the way Supercast works, they can only take one of our feeds and turn that into the private feeds for everybody. And so we have like a master feed of our plus plus content that we send to Supercast. And so all of a sudden now you have to get all of our episodes instead of just JS party, which is, you know, people are understand like, sorry, that's just the way it works. Please just delete the ones you don't like. Or if you can find a podcast app that provides filters inside the app, which there are uh, real nerdy podcast apps where you can like, I want to subscribe to this feed, but only if this string matches or whatever, please do that instead. And so that was a bummer because it's, we, you know, we say it's better, but when you sign up and you're like, this is actually worse than what I was doing before, besides the bonus content and the ad free. So now that I built custom feeds, it solved that problem. You can go in and create a custom JS party only feed and subscribe to that. And I thought I had to bring everything first party to get that done. And then I realized why just build the custom feeds feature and let all I needed on our app was to know if you're a plus plus member. And because Supercast uses Stripe, it's our Stripe account. I can just hit the Stripe API, figure it all out. And so I'm kind of sidestepping, which has been really nice because it lets me solve that problem for folks. But then I'm like, now I don't have less motivation to get off Supercast because that was one of the major reasons I wanted off. And now it's mostly about money because they take a little bit of money, which is fine, but we'd obviously save some by not having to use them. And just that autonomy and like complete control of the experience which are less, less motivating than, you know, custom feeds. So that's part of the app this year and people are loving it. They're loving it. Yeah. Anyways, we're, yeah, we're upstream now. Take us back, take us back to the main river. I mean, I think it's fun to think about, we talk about building, you know, selecting your tool chest, but as a business, you're building your own tool chest as you go, right? Your business is not this software. The software right. is the tools for your business. Yeah, 100%. And you have to decide, like, just like anything else, do we build or buy, you know? And there's a lot of off-the-shelf tools. There are way more now than there were in 2016 and 2015 when we made this choice. 
where it's like, would I build a custom platform today? Probably not. It, it would depend on what exactly we're trying to build, but we do some partner broadcasts. So like we produce Grafana's big tent and for them, we're like, just go sign up for transistor. It's a great service. Uh, Fireside was a, another good one that just got acquired uh, by John Nunemaker, who's a friend of ours. And so that one's going to be getting better. They're like, there's options. And most people do not need what we built back then. But now that we have it, you know, use it to make our business better. Well, there's no shortage of helpful AI tools out there. But using these AI tools means you got to switch back and forth, back and forth between yet one more tool. So instead of simplifying your workflow, it just gets more complicated. But that's not how it works when you're using Notion. Notion is the perfect place to organize lots of stuff, tasks, tracking your habits, writing beautiful docs, collaborating with your team, knowledge bases, and the more content you add to Notion, the more this cool thing called Notion AI can personalize all of the responses for you. Unlike generic chatbots, Notion AI already has the context of your work. Plus, it has multiple knowledge sources. It uses AI knowledge from GPT-4 and Claude, and that helps you chat about any topic. And here's the kicker. Now in beta, Notion AI can search across Slack discussions, Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, and even more tools like GitHub and Jira. Those are coming soon. And unlike specialized tools or legacy suites that have you bouncing between different applications, Notion is seamlessly integrated, infinitely flexible, and beautifully easy to use. So you are empowered to do your most meaningful work inside Notion. From small teams to massive Fortune 500 companies, these teams, both small and large, use Notion to send less email, cancel more meetings, save time searching for their work, and they reduce spending on tools, which helps everyone stay on the same page. You can try Notion for free today when you go to notion.com slash jsparty. That's all lowercase letters, notion.com slash jsparty. And hey, Notion is powerful. It's easy to use. Notion AI is amazing. And when you use our link, you are supporting JS Party. And I know you love that. Once again, notion.com slash JS Party. Let's talk a little bit about the business because I would bet there's a fair number of people here who want to run their own business in some form or another. Maybe it's just a freelance business, right? Getting out from... Sure under people's thumbs. What are the tools you use to run the business? What did you use back when you were contracting? Like what what would you lean on if somebody's in that or what's what's in that side of your tool chest? Right. Okay, so obviously you have things like payroll and invoicing and then you have collaboration and communications. And I can go a little bit through checklist on that. So we use FreshBooks, Adam, for those who don't know Adam Sokoviak, my business partner and co-host of the ChangeLog. He signed us up for FreshBooks like probably a decade ago and I've always used it. Uh, I used Harvest when I was a contractor. I really liked Harvest. Had lots of flexibility and it was also simple. They had a really, I, mean, I think they're still doing their thing. I always talk in the past tense because I don't use it anymore, but it sounds like they're dead or something. Like I'm sure you can go out there to get harvest.com and check it out today. I really liked Harvest for invoicing, but uh, FreshBooks is what Adam was using and totally serviceable, good service. I don't know. There's my review. It works well for invoicing. Uh, we use gusto.com for payroll and they're great because they provide all the kind of all the things that small businesses need, but don't want to have to hand roll HR stuff, vacation stuff, blah, 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 built into gusto taxes, etc. Dropbox is a big one, as I already mentioned. We use that for all of our file sharing and stuff. And then everything else is like Slack, uh, Zulip. We've added for our community now. We're kind of transitioning over to Zulip. And I can't think of anything else. What else is there for our business, K-Ball? I mean, you really don't, depending on what you're doing, you really don't need that much. Like right. I, I run my whole side business off of FreshBooks also mm -hmm. and like Google Suite essentially. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess we do use Google suite as well for, for email and like, and docs it's pretty much all you need for, for something like consulting or I'm doing coaching, right? right. Things like that. Like you need a way to communicate with people and you need a way to bill people. Yeah, totally. And whatever service you're delivering. So a way to deliver your service. Right. It's kind and of I it. think, 
on the sales side or the customer side, Adam has tried multiple CRM tools over the years. I'm not sure if we've ever landed on a CRM that we've been like, this is the one for us, but we aren't a typical sales team either. So I'm not sure what he would say about that. I just don't use it. So I know we've, I've been signed up for lots of different services over the years. Like we're going to try this one now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it depends, right? And as you highlight, as your business scales, depending on what you're doing, you need different things, but like to get started, Mm -hmm. it's really not much. Yeah. I mean, all you gotta do is ask yourself like, what am I doing here? And then how do I do each thing? It's like, well, we are selling ads, right? We're selling these sponsorship campaigns. So we have to be able to sell one, produce one, and then invoice somebody at the end of the day. And so you figure that out and it's like, well, we're hiring somebody. Okay. We gotta be able to pay them. And you figure that out. And so you just kind of add these things as the needs arise. And, um, no, there's so, I mean, to, I guess, Silicon Valley and the greater tech industry's credit, like there's a lot of good services you can build your business on nowadays Yeah. to where it's not that hard to get started. It's really not like you have a plethora of choices. There's competition. Prices aren't too bad. You can start a small business relatively easy and cheap uh, using internet-based tools. Yeah, it's shockingly easy. I feel like the core problem is figuring out what what is something you can sell that people want to buy. <laughs> yeah, like that's still the really hard part, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the core of things. But all these operational headaches that used to do capital, you need all this other stuff for like most businesses, not a big deal. There's options. Yep. So that's podcasting tools, business tools. What other kind of tools you want to talk what about? What other kind of tools you got, man? All right. So, um, well. How about as a podcast listener? You mentioned like geeking oh, out yeah. on more extensive tooling. Like I'm still on Apple Podcasts. What do you use? Oh, we got to get you off there, man. All right. Actually, it's gotten a lot better. But T- Tell me the tools. What should I be doing? So I, I'm a big fan of indie podcast apps. And I think that you can find one that you can fall in love with. And I like to have be able to have a relationship with the person who's building the tool. I just feel like that's one of the reasons why Zulip is so cool for us. It's like we're like... We know the Zula people now. And if there's a thing that we want to talk about with them, like we can just talk about it. Whereas if you don't like something about your Apple podcasts, you know, go take a long walk off a short bridge. You might as well, because you're not going to talk to Apple about it. You yeah, know, you're SOL. So, you know, I can tell you which podcasting app I use, but there's a whole bunch of small ones that are really great. Overcast is the one that I use. Pocket Casts is really cool and open source, um, owned by Automatic. So, you know. So, so open source in quotes. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, what do you, I mean, after, what, like, after what they've been doing, what do you call that anymore? Right? Like, yeah, I don't know. Good question. I mean, it's MIT and everything like that, but you know, Matt's proven himself to be, uh, I don't know, kind of unreliable or un, what's the word for someone who you can't, who's uncertain, you know, you don't know what he's going to do next. I mean, WordPress is theoretically GPL. Like it is GPL, right? So now it's just like trademark and, uh, services. I don't know. It, it's getting murky. For sure. But as a Pocket Cast user, it's just cool that it's open source. You can watch them build it. You're not necessarily, I wouldn't go any further than that myself, but it's just cool that it's out there. And what's interesting was that it wasn't open source. Matt Mullenweg buys it via automatic and he open sources a thing. So, like, the guy used to have a lot of street cred with me. That's why I'm very confused at this point. Uh, Because I thought that was very cool. Maybe he went on one of those uh, ayahuasca trips that has everybody freaking out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. He was enlightened, and he saw the light, and he wanted he wanted to change his ways. I don't know. (laughs) So that's a good one. There's Podcast Addict. There's Castro. There's all these ones, and they just have specifically the thing that I like about them is the chapter support is like the ability to use the advanced features. And all the new burgeoning podcasting namespace stuff. So like podcasting community is trying to innovate and change and make podcasting better. But because Apple and Spotify kind of have a stranglehold on those audiences, it's hard. And so the more people we get using the indie apps who are actually innovating and trying new things, then the better off the whole ecosystem is of like open podcasting. And so I'm always in favor of the open side of podcasting, even though we exist everywhere. But much rather have you on Apple Podcasts than Spotify, because Spotify is like the worst way to listen to podcasts. I just can't understand it. I've just been on Apple Podcasts by default, right? I've been there for so long. Yeah. Why not? But uh, all right, I'm inspired. I'm going to pull my phone out and install Overcast. Okay, cool. If you're listening to this on Spotify, there's better worlds out there, I'll tell you. 
there's podcast apps that support chapters in such a way that as a podcaster, I can name a chapter, I can add a link so that when you're looking at that chapter, you can click on the name of the chapter and follow the link to the thing that we're talking about. So if we're discussing an article that we just read, I can put the link to the article in there and you can click on it and read it while we talk about it. And I can attach imagery. So while that chapter is active, it becomes the, it takes over your cover art for the podcast that you're listening to. And so I can reference a diagram or a meme and put that meme in your podcast app while we talk about it. Spotify won't let you do that. So if you want better, better memes, you want the better memes, man. It's all about the memes. Anyways, that's my sales pitch for Indies. Plus you support independent developers, which feels good, you know? Totally. Bringing this back around. So we've talked about coding, languages and dev frameworks, podcasting, running the business, other good stuff. I realized when we talked about coding, though, we barely touched on JavaScript and we are on JS party. So when you're writing JavaScript, what are your go-to libraries, frameworks, et cetera? Oh, okay, well. I'm going to kill your street cred right here. You're going to get me called out as an imposter on JS Party. Um, as I said earlier, I'm a JavaScript sprinkles person, but I'm also a right tool for the right job person. So I've definitely used React and I've actually went out and chose to pull React into a project. And so it's not like I'm just anti. I do not like single page apps. I don't like to use them. I don't like to write them. Saying this as one of the people who wrote one of the early popular single page apps to exist when I rewrote the GrooveShark Flash app, which had millions of users in HTML and JavaScript back in like 2012, 2011. No, it was, it was pre, yeah, 2010. So I like server rendered HTML and JavaScript. What do I use? I use all the built-in stuff mostly. So I use the DOM APIs, query selector all, I'll write small functions that wrap that. Our app right now, changelog.com, which like I said is eight years old, uses a jQuery alike called Umbrella JS that was like a super light version of jQuery's API and event handlers and callbacks and all the stuff that people think is terrible practice today. I don't have a favorite front end framework because I just don't use them. <laughs> there, there's an unpopular opinion. I haven't used any. I mean, I've used React, I've done toy apps, but I don't really count those. And so I just use JavaScript, man. I don't use TypeScript. I like Node.js. I've used Dino. And I like that. Node.js, I think, is a great platform. And I've used it successfully multiple times. Really like it. And if JavaScript was a little bit more ergonomic for me, I would probably use it even more. It's gotten better. But it used, you know, I also have like a long standing. I remember it in the old days, so it's hard for me to have like that change of emotion around it, you know. Like I'm I'm on JS Party because I love web development. I love the web platform. I'm not a JavaScript lover and I'm a TypeScript hater. Y'all know that. <laughs> so there you go. You called me out. There's where I stand. I don't really use front end frameworks, Cable. Well, I was I was going to look and try to see, you know, how much JavaScript is there on changelog.com. Not very much. And the core app JS, if I load the home page. It's minified, but I get a grand total of 64 kilobytes. That's not bad, right? That's not bad. Yeah. That's not much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want much. I want my web pages to load as fast as possible to as many people as possible in constrained devices. And if I can get away with it, I would use zero. Not because I don't like it, because I think that that's ultimately a more rock solid and fast experience for most people. So I sprinkle it on in the form of, I guess, 64 kilobytes. I think maybe more for the player. I'm trying to figure out. That looks like that's loaded separately. The player, I think, should be bundled in, though. Is it? Wow. Yeah. It just looks like it's not. And we used to use TurboLinks to make a single-page app-like experience, but I actually have also removed that just because people aren't really browsing our website as we wanted them to back when we first built it. When we had like a news feed, we thought there'd be commentary, blah, blah, blah. And you'd be like listening to a show and like checking out different stuff. And so we wanted that player to stay. Um, and so we built TurboLinks based spa like experience where the URLs change, but you're not reloading the whole page. And we rocked that for probably six years. And I took it out just last year because 
it's just not the way people used our website. And it's just additional bloat and had a few things where it would introduce little bugs here and there that were manageable. But if you can just not have that class of problems, then why not? So I took that out as well. The player is the majority of the JavaScript. And then you have some stuff like some overlays. There's not much. There's really not. I mean, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at my network tab right now. And like my extensions are injecting more JavaScript than your website has. <laughs> that makes me feel good, K-Ball. I like that. Yeah. All right. So go to tools. No JavaScript. Not no JavaScript, but just, just enough. Just a pinch. Just a pinch. No, I don't have a go-to front-end framework. If I was going to build something today, I have used Svelte recently. I take that back. I wouldn't call it my go-to framework, but I use Svelte. And I thought, this thing is cool. So I, that one got me. I would probably grab SvelteKit or Preact, maybe. Just about, well, it depends on what I'm building, of course. But the chances of me doing a single-page app, unless it's like I'm building a Gmail competitor or something, very low. Very low. More likely a Spotify competitor. Ah, <laughs> someone should replace Spotify. Just for podcasting. Just for podcasting. Yeah, I got no problem with the music player. And it's gotten better on podcasting. They're, so, they're supporting transcripts now, and they do support chapters halfway, which is better than it used to be. It used to be no way. So it's not like they aren't trying, but when they do, they do it their own way. Like you're going to write the Spotify version. They're not going to adopt an open standard. It's always like some engineer had to show off inside Spotify and build their own spec, you know? That kind of stuff makes me mad too. Anyways, now I'm just rambling and ranting. Now we're rambling. We're we're I think we've wrapped the the gamut yeah. of tools. Is there anything you use on a daily or weekly basis that we have not talked about yet? Well, we briefly mentioned AI stuff. And I have recently switched my standard usage off ChatGPT. So I was just a ChatGPT for standard usage for the first two years. When did it come out? November two years ago. So not quite two years. Call it 18 months. And then Llama 3 just got good enough. And so I'm out there beating the drum of like, why not use the open-ish version versus the purely server-side thing. And so I've cut back on my chat GPT. I still have it on my phone. I use it mostly for like, create me an image of this thing because totally. it's just so, so it's easy. So, good. so It's so fun too. Yes. My wife absolutely loves that feature. In fact, she's on the free plan. I'm on the paid plan for chat GPT. And so she gets like, three a day, two or three a day. And so she'll prompt like two or three and then she'll be like, can you paste this prompt into your phone and send me the picture? Because I want a, a fifth, sixth and seventh attempt at this image. The maddening part about those image generators is they just can't spell right. Have you noticed this? <laughs> yep. Because they're not actually spelling words. Yeah, you cannot put text in there. No, I mean, you can, but they're going to spell it wrong and it's going to be weird. And you can tell it like, nah, you spelled that wrong. And basically it's like, I don't know how to spell. I'm just put, drawing pixels, you know? Yep. Which is hilarious, but needs to be fixed. So I use it for that. But I've installed Olama on my MacBook, and I'm using a desktop app called Enchanted, which is basically a ChatGPT-esque uh, GUI for interacting with various LLMs, and you can configure it which one to use via a server URI, similar to the way you can with Zed or VS Code or you know Vim. And so I have it using Llama 3.2, and I've been pretty happy with that setup for just, you know, answer my questions and generate some text and whatever. I'll ask it coding questions. I'm still not like, I haven't figured out using the coding tools inside of the code editor quite as much. I'm still, because I started off just like, I'll go ask ChatGPT and I'll come back. I did that for a while and I, that's where I kind of feel like I'm vanilla and I'm probably behind the curve. Zed has some stuff where you can like highlight a thing and then like send that in as context and stuff, but I just haven't gotten that far. I'm sure you could probably help me with some of this. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the places I found Cursor to be really ahead of the curve mm -hmm. in a couple of ways. One is their sort of ability to let you specify context and you can like add files and add them to your context and things like that. But the other thing they have that I think is really nice is they have their own custom diffing model. So you get something back from whether it's, you know, Llama or I love Sonnet uh, as a tool here or, you know, GPT-4 or whatever, you know, kind of, LLM model you're using, 
But then applying that to your file correctly is actually not always trivial. Like they're not always giving you good diffs. Right. And so what Cursor has is they have their own proprietary model that is like, take this thing that comes back from the LLM and turn it into an actual appliable diff. And that seems to, I think, make a big difference. Now, I don't know, Zed may be doing something similar. Like there's probably, it's pretty clear that that's a need. And so I would imagine that anyone who's building a business around this is going to be building those tools. Um, that is one of the places where the open source variations on this really fall short. They are just not nearly as good at applying the changes that come back. Yeah, they're pretty good at just being a chat bot, you know, and doing what ChatGPT basically does. But yeah, turning it into an overall wrapped product is always been where open source tends to lose. I did download Cursor. It just bugs me that I like, I understand why they're like, we need to just be our own editor. Like to me as a product person, I totally hundred percent get that. And I think if they continue to do what they're doing, they'll get it to where it's good enough. And it is a VS code fork. So it's not like it's completely foreign to anybody, but it's just a crappier editor. I mean, it is. And so like, I don't want to switch all my things in order to go get that experience. However, I did have a memory leak in a note app that I built. And I, I didn't put any work into this memory leak. I just knew it was a Chromium thing, like Puppeteer. Eventually, Chromium is just like, just leaking memory and, and it would crash my app server, right? And it just started crashing. It would crash like once a week at first. And then it started crashing like once every couple of days, running as a server on fly. And I would just get sick of the crash reports. Crashing is no big deal, honestly, because it just reboots the thing and it comes back up again. And, and anyways, I was like, I don't really want to deal with this memory issue problem you know i'm not freeing something here or there i'm calling const when i should call letter i don't know what i'm doing i'm realizing that's probably not the problem but i just like gave my file it's just like a node it's like server.js right i just took my node app and i just put it in the cursor and i just said i got this memory problem and it's like i'm gonna rewrite this for you do, 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 do. and then i was like yeah that looks like it might fix the problem pasted it in haven't had an app crash since so super successful with that project, but I just didn't like... It's not... Yeah, it, well, and I, I have the similar problem, right? So I use the Vim bindings because, of course, and mm -hmm. it's slow. It's just slow. Mm. And the undo, like the implementation or the interaction of the undo with the AI completes is broken. It's totally mm. bored. So if I'm editing something where I'm just like, I want to go in, I know the change I want to make, I'm going to make it, I will still open up new Vim in a terminal. Mm -hmm. That said, for larger scale transformations, like worth it. It's totally worth it. And you can do like multi file transformations. You can do a single file where you're like refactor this to do this. I've done similar things where I'm like, this is broken. It does this, fix it. And it'll just yeah. do it. And, and you look at the code and you're like, actually, this is pretty much, had I known that, I would have wrote this, you know? Yes. And it doesn't even know me. It's just writing code. And I'm like, yeah, I'll just go ahead and accept that. And the thing is, you can't turn your brain off with it, right? Like, no. cause it will still do things wrong or it'll misinterpret or whatever, but it's like, as if you had somebody, you, you know, a really junior developer you could delegate to, you're like, go write this code for me. No, that's not right. No, that's not right. Change this, do it this way. Okay, great, go. But it's so fast. Yeah, they're getting there. It's going to get there. It's just not knowing exactly like what it looks like in the meantime. And what to what's worth your while and what's not. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of like still wading into the deep end. I'm not like deep into it. They've also got the scaling issues, right? So like yeah. Cursor has had their hacker news moment or their blow up online moment or whatever. And like mm -hmm. because they do things like route stuff through their own router so that they, you know, are proxying for you and they have their their diffing models, like they're running their own models and stuff, like traffic goes through their servers and they're a small team and so when like they get hit with these massive surges of traffic like they don't always handle it well sometimes it it's like moving through molasses mm -hmm. well that's just a time and money problem you know yeah. money and time will fix that one eventually they will solve that but yes yep. it is it is interesting once you once i've like made my brain shift to okay i can do this work and it's it's interesting going into like i went into a legacy project the other day and i was like i don't remember how any of this stuff is working and it was so convenient to be able to just load it up in cursor ask the chat like what is this doing okay change it to do this thing and have it just work I'm a believer now. I'm a true believer. <laughs> this stuff is, you know, it's imperfect. It's broken. It's not intelligent per intelligence. Right. It's probably the biggest breakthrough in terms of coding productivity I've seen in my lifespan. 
I think that's fair. I was trying to think back. Is there another been other major breakthroughs? But I mean, I guess there's the long, slow rise of open source stuff and API availability, yeah. right? Like, so it's not new that we're making things easier for software developers because, like, you want to start a new service now, you can integrate with every other service out there very quickly. Just throw up open source. You know, mm -hmm. it's shockingly fast to get a very powerful application. Log in with your Google account, send email, do this, do that, so do that. Stuff. Like you could set that all up in a few days and things that would have taken weeks and weeks of custom code back in the day. So right. there has been an accumulation of improvements over time. Right. But like in terms of a single step function change, it's shocking. Yeah, I was thinking like this like the first programming language that was above assembly or something. But even those were probably smaller incremental changes that eventually became big in terms of productivity compared to this, which seems to be, although there are steps along the way, but at the end of this, the productivity boost is going to be just astronomical across the world, for sure, for sure. Well, and I hope it leads to, honestly, more businesses that are not software businesses able to do what you did of like, hey, you know, yeah. we're building our own tools for this because the tools out there aren't there yet or they're not good or they don't handle our niche use case. Right. Like that's, I think, the really cool thing about these tools is they enable a swath of software development that probably wouldn't have happened before because it wasn't economical. Yeah, well said. I hope so. I think that will probably happen. And if it's anything like past innovations, it will produce not less work, but more work just at a different layer of the stack. Yeah. And it'll take time to get there, right? Yeah. It takes time to adjust, but I think we will. Anyway, that's a good tool closing, right? Oh, yeah, you man. You bring your tools in. You had your toolbox, but this new tool, it's worth uh, pulling into that toolbox. 100%. At the end of the day, you know, if you're trying to build something, the toolbox is just a means to the end, you know? Like, I would happily throw it out if I could get the end result without it. Wouldn't you, K-Ball? Mostly. I like a few of my tools. Maybe there's a little bit of joy in there. Sure. Maybe I would hesitantly throw things out, but... I think overall I'd, I'd be willing to part with pretty much all of my tools in order to get the end result faster, cheaper, and you know without cutting my finger. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's call that a day. Thank you, Jared. Thanks, man. Thanks for uh, dissecting my tools and call me out on the front end, man. Everyone's going to think I'm an imposter now. Thanks. If the shoe fits. I, I was going to say, no <laughs> lies detected. Like, No, that's just true. That's how I feel. You know? It's all good. So it is what it is. All right. That is JS Party for this week. Thanks for hanging with us. Hopefully you find at least one of my tools useful in your work. If not, go back and listen to the episode called Digging Through Nick Neesey's Toolbox. Lots of gems in there. And if you haven't yet, check out Changelog News. It's the industry's only weekly newsletter that's also a podcast. One reader calls it so good, he considers it a competitive advantage. Read and listen to the latest issue at changelog.com slash news. Big thanks once again to our partners at fly.io, to our beat freak, the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder, and to our longtime sponsors at Sentry. We love Sentry. You might too. Use code changelog. Save 100 bucks on the team plan. Next up on the pod, Tanner Lindsley and his tan stack. Stay tuned right here. We'll have that episode ready for you next week.